screen when I start. Welcome, dear audience uh, and speakers. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you at uh, our discussion entitled Roma Self-Representation in the History of the Venice Biennale. Uh, today's discussion is a program in the ERIAC International Outreach Program entitled International Membership Engagement. And the support of the Federal Foreign Office made it possible for the visionary leaders uh, to come together today. This discussion is also a lab day in the framework of the VIV, widen European access to cultural communities via, via Europeana. And we hope to feed this discussion together with many important cultural heritage items into this comprehensive archive of European cultural history. Uh, today's event takes place uh, in uh, the beautiful office of the Council of Europe Venice representation. And uh, we come together with visionary leaders, the catalysts uh, of the Roma cultural movement. Uh, in the lack of collecting, archiving, uh, and preservation strategies, in the lack of institutions, these discussions are central to the preserving of our cultural history. And uh, also we sitting here today know very well this cultural history. It is important to carve them into the conscious of our community, into the conscious of Europe in general, and transfer this knowledge to the next generations. I would like to open the discussion uh, by inviting our hosts to welcome the audience and the speakers as well. Uh, first, Dr. Rosa Cisneros, the coordinator of uh, Aviv, uh, dancer and choreographer, uh, dance historian and critic, Roma scholar and sociologist and flamenco historian. Rosa, it's so lovely to have you here today with us. Um, and you are our virtual host. Uh, I also invite uh, Luisella Pavan Wolf, head of uh, head of office uh, of the Council of Europe representation in Venice, and a long time support supporter of ERIAC's initiatives for cultural inclusion and recognition, and uh, and a supporter endorser of both the Futu Roma exhibition in 2019 and the 2022 exhibition. So I would like to ask the two hosts to welcome the audience. Rosa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely invitation. I'm really excited to be here with everyone. So many lovely people um, in Venice sitting next to you, but also online. Thank you to everyone um, who's made this lab day and this event happen, especially the technical team. Um, for those who um, would need or would like um, an audio description, I am a female wearing a striped blue top with a royal blue um, jacket over. I have medium length dark black hair, um, wearing glasses, olive skin tone and sitting in a white chair. Thank you. I am here as Rosa Cisneros, an artist and researcher, part of the Weave team that is um, based at Coventry University in the UK. I just pulling up my slides now, very briefly um, want to share. Can you see my my? Yes, 
I see heads. Yes. Okay. Yes. I am part of the Coventry University Institute for Creative Culture, the Center for Dance Research. So I wear several hats, um, but it's this project has allowed me to collaborate with our um, friends and family over at Ariac, and they're also a, um, a project partner. And we've, as um, Timea said, is to widen European um, let me just widen ac European access to cultural communities via Europeana. It's a new project that's co-financed by European Union under the Connecting Europe Facility Program, which is aimed to enrich Europeana within with great content of tangible and intangible heritage and to develop new tools. So there's several things we're trying to do with the project, um, but a main thing is to bring cultural communities together via the Europeana platform, which I'll very briefly describe what that is in a few minutes um, but we want to look at representation um, inclusion accessibility several of these big questions but really kind of focusing in via the communities and what the communities um, are asking themselves and or what they could be asking themselves and also how that can feed back into major cultural heritage institutions and other um, spaces so um, yes so what is Europeana? Europeana is um, a digital library and they work with thousands of European archives, libraries and museums to share cultural heritage for enjoyment, education and resources and research. They are a website that's located online. They have several um, items on their digital library. Some are open access, some are not. They're different um, um, copyright around different objects and so the hope as they put it they want to transform the world with culture they want to build on Europe's rich heritage and make it easier for people to use whether for work for learning or just for fun so they really want to take cultural existing cultural heritage items and open those up to more people, but also they want to aggregate more content. And that's what we're doing within the project is we're working with several communities to do that. And within this um, lab day, we're looking at the Roma community, but we also have Portuguese folk dance. We have the Castellers from Catalonia and Spain. Um, so really, really diverse uh, communities. Um, as we know, the fire of Notre Dame really um, made us realize that there is a need to preserve cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, including uh, spaces, buildings, um, larger architectural objects. And so with that, we also have a Slovenian par uh, partner, um, Artur, who are looking at castles and 3D modeling. And so this technological component of the project is very much a part of in sitting alongside how we look at um, voices from the community, that cultural heritage, and what digital technology and how digital technology can support that. And I've been talking a lot about cultural heritage um, and tangible and intangible. And so a, a very important part of the project is looking at dance and this questions around intangible cultural heritage. How is it that we we aggregate, um, pull that together, talk about, put language around that? And in, in my case, it's with dance, but other project partners are looking at how we write about, talk about um, cultural, intangible cultural heritage. And to do that, we also are developing tools with um, point modeling and 3D modeling. So again, looking at these macro kind of building um, and castles, but also the micro, the body and things that are constantly moving. Um, to do that, we have um, the intersections of people, spaces, buildings, and technology. And within Weave, we have a very specific um, focus. Um, as I said, we're aggregating content to through to Europeana through the lab day. So the lab days really are looking at what objects, videos, photographs, what conversations, what questions are we asking ourselves to help us add and, and make sure that the language that is in Europeana is self-representative and, and considering all of these really nuanced, delicate topics. Um, that I know we will talk about today in the framework of the pavilion. So 
and in part of the uh, a key part of weave is to develop a toolkit so that what we're doing and how we're reflecting within the project with the various communities can also be used by other communities so that they can also take um, the framework or guidelines to also consider and ask themselves some of the these very um, heavily you know highly charged questions as well so we will have a toolkit um, and Yes, that brings us to today, this idea of the lab day. So what is a lab day? The lab day is um, a space where we take up uh, either a problem or a question and try to find solutions and also think about what solutions are coming from within the community and how do we um, ensure that a method that is allowing voices uh, diverse voices to come together to really reflect on that and to in be inclusive and accessible as well. And so it's a real bottom up approach, but also it's inviting people that are in those positions of power that are sitting in those cultural heritage institutions to come and listen and to brainstorm as well. So it's a real, um, I, I like this phrase that I learned last week, it's a safe but also a brave space, a space where people feel that they can put themselves out there and, and reflect and maybe ask the clumsy questions. Um, and so within the project, as I said, we're offering and building a toolkit. Um, so we have something um, starting in January 2022, these capacity building cafes where you can come and, and meet some of the people that have been in the lab days, that have been developing or offering content and ask them questions. And so it's really informal, oh, you know, ask me anything kind of um, space. I should say that there are several lab days that we're planning from now until December. I think they're about seven or eight. We have the Portuguese folk dance, the Castaillers, we have um, uh, Ariac, we'll also be planning a few more. So really diverse um, in their style, their formats. And today we have a beautiful hybrid event. Um, and I, I just have to say thank you to our hosts, but also to the project partners, um, which you can see on the screen that represent and that are supporting the, the various questions we're asking within Europeana, uh, with Europeana, but also within the Weave framework. And I leave us with this lovely uh, picture of people dancing outside and just being together. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rosa. I uh, pass the word. Uh, and the floor to Luisa Lapa Van Wolf, the head of the Office of Council of Europe representation in Venice, our real space, real, real time uh, host. Thank you, Tina, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Italian uh, seat of the Council of Europe. Um, it's Venice office, which is the only uh, representation of the Council of Europe in, in this country. Um, the Council of Europe, I'm sure you all know, it, it's not the European Union. We have 47 member states. We've been um, operating since uh, 1949. And our mandate covers uh, human rights, democracy, and, uh, and the rule of law. Um, we are active in the area of culture and uh, cultural heritage and we've been um, in in this game since uh, since a long time for a long time since 1954 uh, when the first um, convention or european convention on culture was um, put together was issued um, and uh, why do we do this because we look at culture and heritage very much as um, from the point of view of cultural rights, which are, uh, in our view, um, fundamental human rights, um, and from the point of view of culture being um, a constituent element of uh, a democratic uh, environment. Um, for these reasons, we've been um, supporting the creation of uh, ARIAC, 
um, way back since 2014, 2015. And um, I've been personally involved in, in, in this uh, uh, work in um, setting up ARIAC and uh, finding it a, a, a place of, uh, of operations. Um, it's, it's always a great pleasure to uh, welcome Ariac um, in, uh, in Venice and uh, trying to give as much support as we can to um, their uh, participation uh, in, the, in the Biennale, um, which in our view, uh, it's to do with, with art, with innovation in art, with creation, uh, with freedom of expression, um, art research, but it's uh, it's also and and perhaps from our point of view, above all, about um, changing perceptions, uh, working on stereotypes, um, decreasing uh, prejudice, um, and uh, um, making uh, Europe and its citizens aware of the um, incredible um, contribution that uh, Roma um, culture uh, has given uh, to, to all of us. Um, the, um, the presence of, of ARIAC uh, in Biennale uh, has been ongoing since uh, 2007. And um, what we are hoping uh, to be able uh, to achieve beyond uh, this rendezvous of uh, 2022 would be a permanent presence um, by ARIAC in, the, um, in this important uh, international um, biannual uh, meeting. So far, ARIAC has been present uh, in Biennale Arte, and in my view, we should uh, look at the possibility of uh, um, ensuring in future its presence uh, in the um, architectural biennale as well as in the various um, um, sessions of, of biennale to do with music, with dance and, and with art. Thus recognizing um, what I was um, labeling before as the great contribution of uh, um, Roma culture to the cultural and uh, artistic uh, life um, and heritage of, uh, of Europe. I would leave it at that. And again, um, welcoming Ariac and uh, all those who are listening uh, to us through this webinar today. Um, this Weeb uh, Lab Day, which, as I heard, shares very much um, the same type of approach that the Council of Europe has, that of wide access uh, to this incredible um, European heritage, um, wide access by all to our uh, amazing uh, European heritage. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Luisella Pavan-Wolf, uh, and thank you also, Dr. Rosa Cisneros, uh, for hosting uh, our event today. Uh, we enter the second part uh, of our discussion, uh, and uh, to save some time, since we're already behind schedule, uh, I uh, just very quickly introduce this next phase when we go in chronological order of uh, the cultural history that the Venice Biennale uh, representation uh, means uh, for the Roma community. Uh, and we start at 2007. Uh, I apologize, I need to change hat and I will very shortly uh, reflect on the 2007 initiative, but let's watch a short video.
I uh, make a, a few sentences just to introduce uh, the 2007 Roma Pavilion. Uh, I speak from the position of uh, the curator. I, I was the curator for the 2007 Paradise Lost exhibition. Uh, it was uh, an extremely difficult uptaking. Uh, and at the end, the Open Society Foundation, Allianz Kulturstiftung, and the European Cultural Foundation uh, made it possible to create this uh, exhibition. 16 artists from eight Europe European countries came together for this uh, first uh, exhibition of historical character. The Biennale opened its doors in 1895, and until 2007, there was no tangible uh, Roma contribution, visible contribution. This was the first time that our oppressed, invisible, and unknown cultural genealogy became visible and even celebrated in the frame of the Venice Biennale. Uh, I would like to pass the word to Professor Dr. Etta Brooks, Associate Professor at Rutgers University, uh, School of uh, Arts and Science, and Chair of Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, uh, whose research interest is visual cultures, artistic practice, mm -hmm. camps and encampment, digital media and belonging, nationalism, postcolonialism, and critical race theory. Um, et al. Uh, was a contributor to the 2011 Roma exhibition, a contributor to We Roma, and is a jury member to the 2019 and 2022 pav uh, pavilions or Roma exhibitions, I apologize, Roma exhibitions, um, uh, and uh, a very co uh, important uh, member to the Ariac community. Et Thank you, Tamea, for that lovely introduction. And um, it's such a pleasure to be with everyone today. Um, you know, I guess what I want to talk about is partly the Roma presence within Venice and, and within the Biennale structure. And um, in particular, to begin with 2011, um, you know, thinking about that exhibition, which was called Call the Witness. and. That exhibition was really, I would argue, an attempt to move away from kind of the physicality of cultural production and into the realm of testimony. And through testimony of Roma and non-Roma, the idea was to come to this kind of claiming of, of history and claiming of space through, um, and for those of you who are familiar with kind of the language of testimony and the ways in which testimony has been used, uh, as an archive, right, through a kind of non-perpetrator lens, right, so coming from people's own voices and own experiences and talking about the, the centrality and the importance of Romani cultural production. Um, I was also part of the 2012 Architecture Biennale collaborative event called uh, Zupa Zup Zup, Zupa Zup Soup where um, with Leah Whitman Salkin, which if Leah, you're in the webinar or at the audience, hello, um, where we invited Romani women from across Italy to come to Venice um, in the School of Architecture for a dinner party, where we set up dinner, we had a discussion about Romani women's needs, desires, uh, dreams of what accommodation and what home would look like. And that discussion lasted over a course of four hours. Um, and it was very kind of generative and quite beautiful. Um, and at the end of it, you know, the one thing that I've, I've always been struck by is that we had this four hour dinner discussion. We, you know, we had cleaned up with everybody. We kind of organized, finished the, the day. And I invited the women that we had been working with and talking with all day out for drinks. And one of the things that they were very clear about was that they didn't feel secure going out into the streets of Venice as, as, as Romani women and being marked as other and perhaps being marked, um, you know, as some, as people who don't belong. And, and when we think about kind of that, that position of non-belonging, you know, we see the ways in which just as Romani culture is so central to, to the culture of Europe, to the culture of the world, we also see the ways in which Romani people and our contributions have continually been marginalized. And so these events in Venice are this moment, right, you know, where we can come together and stake our claim in a way that's often perhaps, um, to borrow the language of Timea, disobedient or disruptive. 
And, and you know, some of the questions that I think we need to bring to that is, you know, what does a claim, a claim staking look like? What kinds of possibilities are opened up by the politics of staying in place? I'm currently writing a book on encampment and, and one of the central kind of formations of encampment, right? I mean, we have the whole history of the camps and, and, and the, the forced uh, imprisonment of Roma in camps uh, during the Holocaust, right? And, and also in other, in other wars and in other forms of genocide. And that's one of the histories that we have to keep central as we're thinking about that. And the other history is, of course, the centrality of practices of encampment to Romani survival. And here I'm thinking about you know, encampment and camp coming from the French succampé to stay in place. And so what does it mean for us to stay in place, right? These kind of iterations of the Biennale from 2007 through 2011, 2012, 2019, and now into 2022 have always been marked by this kind of resistatory practice of encampment and staying in place. Um, and so what I want us to think about is what does it look like then on the other side, right? What are the politics of encampment, but what does belonging look like? What does it mean to belong? And how can we ensure a politics and a practice of true solidarity that's marked by Romani belonging, not just perhaps of the Roma here sitting around the table or of the Romani people watching the webinar, but for all Roma? How do we do that and how do we stake those kinds of claims? Thank you uh, for sharing uh, your uh, contributions at all towards the Biennale uh, uh, events uh, and also for, for speaking so beautifully about our solidarity. Um, and now I invite Dr. Daniel Baker to speak. Uh, uh, mm, Daniel Baker's uh, um, artistic uh, um, curriculum is uh, many, and I have a very uh, subjective reading here to share with you, which is from the perspective uh, of the Roma community. Dania Baker was an exhibiting artist of the 2007 Paradise Lost exhibition, an artist of the Call the Witness exhibition in 2011, he was curator of the Futu Roma exhibition at the 58th Venice Biennale in 2019, and is a jury of the Roma exhibition for 2022. Daniel, please. Thank you, Tamir. I think we're going to play a short film. Jöttek is az emberek, és körülállták a mosolygó cigány tündért. Doja kifésülte földig érő haját, és így szólt. Kapaszkodjatok a hajamba, ne féljetek! Belekapaszkodtak hát Doja szép, erős hajába. Egyszer csak azt érezték, hogy felemelkednek és repülnek, mint az irigyelt madarak. Hosszú, hosszú napokon át kergették így az időt, mire megérte. Nézzetek körül! Ez a cigányok földje! Hey, 
Thank you again to Mayor for the introduction. And could we have the first slide, please? So I'm going to talk briefly about my experience as both an artist and as a curator at the uh, Roma exhibitions at the Venice Biennale. When Timaire reached out to me during her visit to London in 2006, I'd been practicing as an artist for a number of years, but I'd only recently began to consciously operate from within my own Romani subjectivity. My time at art school was spent trying to work out how I fitted into the Western art canon by experimenting with a variety of voices before I began to understand that the preoccupations within my work and in my life did not fit so easily within the received art narrative. After some years of searching, the shift came quite rapidly with the, with the realization that my visual references and my aesthetic vocabulary were grounded in the surroundings in which I grew up, influenced by my Romani community and my family. Meeting Timaire was the beginning of a wider journey beyond the UK, during which connections with other Roma arts practitioners have been made to form an international network that spans many Roma communities and many territories. The effect of Paradise Lost on the individual artists involved was significant. Exhibiting at the Biennale is a great opportunity for any artist, let alone one from a vastly underrepresented community. But perhaps the most empowering outcome was the affirmation of our identities as artists of Roma origin. The bringing together of artists from a variety of backgrounds and diverse experience generated a new sense of community. It also emphasized the intersectionality of Roma contemporary art by moving away from the sense of a homogeneity that underpins most of art that does not fit into the Western canon. Can we have the second slide, please? This is a photo of uh, the artist and other organizers and funders and curator Timea involved in the first pavilion on our search for a venue. The first Roma pavilion, Paradise Lost, proved to be a catalyst for Roma arts representation by committing to a truly global approach to Roma contemporary art, its appreciation and its history. The impact of the project cannot be overestimated in establishing the foundation for the current flourishing of the Roma contemporary art phenomenon. Can we have the next slide, please. In 2019, I was honored to be selected by ARIAC to curate the third Roma exhibition at the Venice Biennale. Throughout the future Roma project, I continue to explore my preoccupations with the links between the traditional and the contemporary between domestic and professional art practice and between individual archives and state collections. These hierarchies of representation remain characteristic of the relationship between the marginal and the elite. And by looking at, into these dynamics, we find new ways of thinking about the relationship between marginalized peoples and mainstream societies. The art world is an unwieldy entity which takes time to react to societal change. It therefore often trails behind other more immediate instruments in reflecting and mediating ongoing and emerging inequalities within society. Consequently, the contemporary state of play is often slow to be mirrored within it, indicating a reluctance to look beyond the customary circuit of galleries, art fairs and biennales to find fresh approaches. Relying upon a limited range of influence and opinion will not necessarily reflect the range and quality of work that is happening at any given time. This is, in my opinion, um, a difficulty within the contemporary art world in that it is continually self-referential. Could we have the next slide, please? Visibility remains a key issue for Roma communities. Negative images of Roma continue to circulate based on historically prejudiced perceptions of the group, and these still need to be countered with alternative examples of Roma culture and Roma life. Contemporary art platforms can engage with wider society in terms of showcasing the realities of the Roma experience and the value of Roma culture. But they also serve the purpose of giving artists from Roma communities a path of professional development through which to further their careers and impact upon wider discourse. They also represent the opportunity for Roma to become part of public debate in a way that is perhaps less confrontational or unsafe than directly political means. 
Consequently, contemporary art platforms can offer possibilities that more activist or politically framed platforms may not. No matter how extreme the message or the action, it can still be viewed as less confrontational within the art world than in other settings. Although it can be said that art practice attached to a specific identity position can be limiting, particularly if their meanings are only relatable within a particular context. I believe that good art can operate in multiple contexts and continue to convey meaning and insight in a variety of situations, transcending their labels whilst at the same time embracing them. Futuroma aim to present an example of this by showing works which carry universal meanings whilst also being grounded within a particular subjectivity. And I'll end by uh, quoting uh, Freeze Magazine's Guide to the Best on View in the Venice Biennale in 2019. Could have the next slide, please. Resisting the forces that delimit their rights and identity, these artists are claiming national idioms, reclaiming national idioms in a way that hark back to the techniques and traditions of Roma diasporas far and wide. As we face a newly divided Europe and the rise of nationalisms and violence against marginalized groups, these gestures of deviant assimilation feel all the more pertinent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Daniel, uh, for your uh, contribution. It is uh, my honor to introduce uh, Miguel Angel Vargas, uh, art historian, theater director, flamenco researcher, member of Fattoria Cultural, Poligono Sur, Institute for Culture and Arts of the Council of Seville, and uh, an important jury uh, member for the Roma exhibition of the 2022 Venice Biennale, but was also a member of the jury already in the 2019 Futu Roma exhibition. The floor is yours, Miguel. Thank you, Via Timea. I was going, well, I, I'm going just to briefly share my experience uh, as a member of the jury of the to um, uh, we 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 call it Roma Pavilion, but, we, but because consciously we we had this desire, so I will keep calling it Roma Family if you allow me. No, okay. <laughs> um, well, it's important that the, the audience know that the, the procedure that, that that we follow in for the selection of the projects. Um, uh, for the Vinale of, um, of of Venice are um, of of the higher highest standard of, of art, and that's linked to the um, the founding principles of Ariac. And as as member of the jury, we bear that in mind. And we when when we go through the different um, proposals, we keep it, we we check that the the projects um, meet the, the standards. And, and that says a lot about the kind of project that normally um, applies to the, this kind of open call. Um, meaning that it, the, the international art scenes of Roma art is very alive and it's very committed to meet the standards of international art. Um, but, but also, um, that also tells a lot about the, 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 the kind of contribution of Roma art and Roma artists in the history of, uh, of art. Um, me, as a person who is linked to flamenco, I can find a, a lot of uh, similar examples in the history of flamenco where um, we can um, we can see that the what we call the contribution of um, of Roma artists it, it, it should be called also creation of Roma individuals, and that's and that's one of the um, of the things that when when we name when, when we use the word contribution we also we we should also think about uh, what the meaning of the creation of something out of the capacity of the of the individual, uh, and that also links that will lead us to to think about what's the meaning of um, uh, of representation. And flamenco could could be as a, a good example um, of 
how is the struggle for Roma recognition in art and culture? Uh, flamenco appeared as an art form in the decade of 1860s. Um, and with the time, um, it has become a symbol of Spain. Um, since the moment in which UNESCO put the eye on flamenco or that there were the first meetings or encounters, well, um, there has been a debate, a hot debate between uh, who, who should be um, allowed to say um, um, who does belong, uh, who does, who that flamenco belong to. Um, and that's a problem because it's not that, um, it's not that we, 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 we are questioned uh, on our capacity or, or that we are questioned of who we, that Roma people has, has been in the regions of flamenco. No one denies that. The problem comes when in reality is the nation state, the country, the state who is the one who has to apply for the UNESCO for the recognition of flamenco as part of the humanity heritage. And that's the problem. So what's the, what's the position of power mm, that this uh, solution leave us? So where are Roma in the middle of this? They are recognized, but as part of the flamenco art scene or even as part of the regions of flamenco, no one will deny that, but we are not in the structure. We are not in the process. So somehow the, what is happening or what we wish, we wish to happen in, in Venice is similar. So we, we have to somehow find a way to not be demanding recognition uh, but uh, to have it because we have the right to have it, not because we have to demand it. So, and that would be my contribution. Uh, thank you, Miguel, for bringing uh, the example of flamenco. Uh, it's important to become conscious and educate also uh, majority societies of our contributions to all natural cultures and uh, and the case of flamenco serves a great example uh, in this education process uh, um, it is uh, my privilege uh, to also welcome amongst the speakers Ilina Chileru and Eugen Raportoru. Ilina Chileru is the curator and Eugen Raportoru is the artist chosen uh, by the area jury and the competition process as the exhibiting artist and curators, curator of the 2022 uh, Roma exhibition. Uh, it is important that we can only whisper congratulations very quietly, but even more passionately uh, until the Biennale is uh, considering uh, our submission, ARIAC submission, and will approve this submission. But our first congratulations, of course, are going out to both of you. And uh, I would like to ask Elena to very quickly extend on the curatorial concept. And I wish to invite Eugene, who is sitting there with the support of Andre Dan, who will help us translate to Eugene, who is a Romanian native speaker. Uh, I want to ask and hear from Eugene, you know, how, what does this opportunity mean to you personally as a Roma individual and as an already established and distinguished Roma contemporary artist? Uh, Ilina, the floor is yours first. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity, first of all. It's, uh, I'm honored to meet you all. Um, I should uh, introduce uh, the fact that I am in an airport. I am between uh, air airplanes. Uh, so um, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, the, the concept of this, uh, this uh, exhibition that I propose to Eriak uh, is titled uh, The Abduction from the Seraglio. 
and um, it comes from uh, a depiction of the abduction from the Seraglio made uh, uh, up after the opera, the re well renowned opera of Mozart, uh, White Male, uh, coming from a, a status of, uh, of uh, a privilege. Um, and uh, the entire arsenal that uh, the, the, rug, the rugs that uh, Eugen is uh, considering for this exhibition, the entire arsenal of images that treat um, uh, exoticization and uh, uh, the, the role of uh, the image of the woman and, and the motherhood and the woman in general and stereotypes. It talks about a lot of stereotypes. Uh, and Eugen is uh, taking all these themes uh, and uh, trying to um, and trying to reinterpret them. I think it is very interesting that he to mention that he is one of the most known Roma artists in Romania, and a lot of young uh, Roma artists are looking up to him. And uh, what he he does with this uh, installation work that he's integrated integrating into his concept uh, is very, very interesting. If you come to, to think of the position uh, that Roma artists are trying right now to accomplish within uh, not only the grounds, uh, the local grounds like uh, the Romanian art scene, but also if you think of it in a larger, in a larger context. It is uh, very much to, to talk about. It also, as you can see from this image, it also it depicts like a, a fragment of interior that was highly oh, yeah. utilized in the households, uh, not only Roma households, but uh, uh, local households in the southeastern uh, wow. Europe. And I would emphasize on the communism households. And this 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 uh, rug that you see here depicting the abduction from the Seraglio is actually a frame. Um, towards an idealized um, view upon uh, history and upon cultural uh, symbols. So this exhibition holds a lot of keys that open up a discussion about history, about understanding history, about perspective, and about shifting perspective, uh, coming from a very simple theme as the one of the rug that everyone used to have in uh, in the 70s or in the uh, starting with the 70s in a uh, well Romanian households but as i said it's kind of a, it became a generalized a stereotype to have this rug uh, inside of your home uh, a thing that um, vanished during the 90s or uh, starting with the 90s once uh, the communist bloc started to fall and um, uh, of course, uh, Eugen combines uh, the painting with the installation work in a very, very playful man uh, manner. And uh, he opens up um, a context for uh, performances and uh, panel discussions about the themes that uh, I aforementioned. Um, the, the role of the woman, the, the stereotype of the, of the Roma artist, why, why not Roma artist, uh, of the Roma community, and, uh, um, and, and, the, and not only the Roma community, but uh, also um, not only the Romanian Roma community, I was trying to mention, but the Roma community itself in the Southeastern Bloc. I hope I was, um, I, I integrated all that I, uh, that I intended. Thank you so much. Eugen? Da. Vreodată că o să ajung și eu să particip cu expoziție personală. Țin să mulțumesc uh, celor de la ERIAC că m-au ales și 
întregii comisii și sper să nu dezamăgesc. Sper să fie cea mai bună expoziție din Bienală. Uh, I, uh, for any kind of artist, uh, and especially for me, it's a big honor to be part of this biennial. And I would like to, to thank you for the chance offered by ERIAC and by the jury. And uh, I hope uh, I will not uh, disappoint uh, the, the public. And uh, uh, from my point of view, from Eugene's point of view, uh, for sure uh, he will do all his best to be the uh, the, the biggest uh, exhibition for, for uh, Roma people in uh, in uh, in uh, Venice, and he will want to represent uh, proudly and uh, with uh, honor the uh, Roma community in this such a uh, big event. Thank you once again. Sper că nu am fost modest. Uh, maybe he doesn't look modest, but uh, you know, uh, he understand that uh, the Roma community it's uh, need to be at uh, the real place uh, where it's supposed to be. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eugene, for joining us. And again, and again, uh, it's uh, we are extremely proud uh, to to uh, receive your application. Uh, and Eriak and the, the supporters will be here, even the jury members will be here to make sure that this will be a true success. And uh, we also must mention uh, that in 2022, uh, we will have another uh, Roma artist within the Biennale, Efrem Malgorzata Mirgatash, who is the chosen artist of the Polish Pavilion. And we will make sure that there is connection and collaboration between the location. And we will make a true attempt to do this in the future. Uh, we are ready with the first part of our discussion. Uh, I also would like to mention and recognize uh, the support of our organizers and technical supporters, Andrea Petrus, uh, for the management of this event and support of Luca Volpato. I also need to say thank you to MSM Molnar and the whole Miros team who is working on the recording and broadcasting of this event. Uh, and uh, I think that we can slowly approach the second part of the discussion. I invite uh, the panelists uh, uh, for an open discussion. And please take a mental note uh, of these questions now uh, so that you can uh, consider these while we respond, which is uh, which are the most important lessons learned from the difficulties perhaps of establishing Roma exhibitions in Venice and what are the solutions uh, for the future scenarios uh, that we might see. Uh, and also a very important question is, how do these exhibitions contribute to the preservation of Roma cultural heritage in general? And finally, what are the most important institutions and allies when it comes to the preservation and storing and holding Roma gypsy traveler Sinti materials for international curating uh, and exhibitions and events that we organize. And I welcome all the panelists to make uh, uh, their contributions in an open way. Feel free to simply indicate if you wish to speak. Etal, may I invite you? Yes, thank you so much, Tamia. Um, you know, one of the things I think that that I find remarkable and one of the lessons I think that that we've learned is regard is regarding the perseverance and continual kind of novelty maybe not not novelty but like the ways in which Romani cultural production is constantly part of an avant-garde and when I say avant-garde, right, I'm being very deliberate because that notion of the avant-garde has always been something that's been appropriated in many ways from Roma um, and then reinforced in a kind of, within a kind of gaje art world. Um, but here I'm thinking, you know, when I, when I go back to think about kind of, for example, the 2011 call the witness, right, based, the idea of which was based not just on kind of this history of testimony, 
but on the idea of a Romani Chris, right? A, 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 a judgment, right? A, the, the, the kind of community forms of adjudication where people, you know, provide a testimony, they, they, they talk out things and work out things as a community. Um, but, you know, and in general, I think across time, one of the things that we can see is that Romani people, Romani artists, Romani knowledge producers, have always continued to produce knowledge, to contribute, to change the world around them for, and, and we do it for ourselves, of course, because we have to, right? I mean, the, the ways in which kind of the history of persecution has always worked has meant that we've had to change the world, to make the world beautiful for ourselves, to make the world possible for ourselves, and to do whatever we can to continue survival in the face of persecution and genocide. And that's a lesson learned, right? That's something that we can take with us is, are the ways in which we continue to produce knowledge, we continue to produce beauty, we continue to produce culture, and we continue to produce love in the face of some of the most virulent forms of, of exclusion, of racism, um, of marginalization that you know, we, we've seen in history. Um, and, and I think in that way, right, that lesson learned is also part of the solution is to recognize how we've continued through, to recognize the beauty that we've produced, the culture that we've produced, and to recognize the very survival that we've carried with us through our community, through our language, right, through our culture across, across millennia. So, so for me, both sides of it, right? That's the lesson and that's the solution. And I think that next question that you asked, Tamea, right, about that, the, the preservation of our cultural heritage, one of the things that also comes to mind is that it's always been kind of up to us. And we can think about that right through a kind of the ways in which the passing down of, of kind of history has always been a kind of oral passing down, right? The passing down of cultural has been through, through teaching and through being together, right? Through a, an intergenerational passage of knowledge. And that intergenerational transmission of knowledge, that, that passing of knowledge from one generation to the other has always been what we've, been, what we've relied upon, right? And it's, it's one of the reasons why you can say in the face of multiple genocides, you know, the Holocaust being one, you know, we look at kind of the history of Spain, the history of, of England, the history of Romania, we see, we see multiple forms of genocide and multiple forms of persecution. And yet here we are, millions strong, still producing knowledge, still producing culture, still producing beauty. Um, and so, so for me, right, one, one of the, the kind of, when we think about the necessary institutions, you know, I could be very blunt and say, we have to just stop the gaje from taking our stuff and our knowledge and our beauty, which is, which is you know, is very blunt, right? And it's, 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 and I'm saying this in a kind of resistatory mode, right? A very strong rhetorical mode. <clears throat> but I think the other side of it is that we also depend upon the solidarity of non-Romani institutions. You know, our, our, we couldn't have built ARIAC without the solidarity of the Council of Europe or Open Society Foundations or certain nation states, right? We couldn't have built what we have without people coming forward and recognizing and saying yes what you do, what you have, who you are is beautiful. And so our claiming of belonging, our claiming of beauty, our claiming of, of who we are depends on, on both things, on the key institutions that, you know, that support us. And that, that's you know, across the world, there are, there are key institutions. And upon also the strength and the perseverance of our community as knowledge producers and as, as cultural producers, as artists, um, as intellectuals. And, and when I say intellectuals, I mean, you know, in the everyday, I don't mean kind of in the university or, or where, you know, because a lot of that persecution has also depended, has really relied upon excluding us from access to certain kinds of formal schooling, right? So, so the knowledge that we get from our mothers, the ways in which, you know, I know how to smell sweet grass and weave sweet, you know, sweet grass is from my mother, the ways in which I know how to cook certain things, the ways in which I know how to tell a safe 
space as opposed to one that, you know, is not going to be good for me or my family. It comes from my people. And those are kinds of knowledges and forms of intellectualism and forms of cultural production that we've been handing down across generations and across centuries. So it's, it's really that balance, right? Both the challenges we face, the lessons we learned, the solution and the possibilities of those, and then what, it, what solidarity means across communities and across spaces and across centuries. Sorry, I went on too long, but thank you. I would say that in terms of lessons learned, <clears throat> perhaps um, it's a good idea to think less about target audiences in terms of who the pavilion, because that's what we're talking about, uh, the exhibition uh, might be um, aiming to cater for. Because I think that the, in my understanding anyway, the kind of, um, for instance, with the second pavilion, I think that was seeking to um, chime with a particular audience, a contemporary art audience, contemporary art press audience, maybe. And I think that was successful on some levels, but it, at the cost of other elements of the exhibition. So I think that, yes, we want to be visible, we want to have as much influence as possible. But I think the way to do that is to be true to the contents of the exhibition and the artworks and the concept itself should be enough to be able to transcend those particular audiences and be able to bring, bring us the kind of um, recognition that we want. Um, I mean, that's what I try to do with Futuroma, basically rely on a good concept and, and the artworks to, to really speak for themselves. I think if... I mean, this is a question for curators and, and um, perhaps more than artists, but I think that as in framing an exhibition, the curator has so much influence that it can turn the same piece of work into a completely different object. So I think that we need to be careful about who our hope for audiences are in a way, put that to one side and make our audience everyone, because the stronger, this is a very strong concept and it's a very strong set of artworks. So I think this is going to work very well. And I think this will, this current exhibition that, that we're having in 2022 will speak to lots of audiences and bring us a kind of um, momentum to continuing from the three previous uh, exhibitions. So I would say that my, my primary lesson learned would be not to try and cater for a perceived audience, but make it as good as we can and to speak to as many people as possible. May I uh, introduce uh, Elena here because she will need to soon catch uh, another flight and uh, she raised her hand, but uh, uh, we have to give her the floor as you can see this. I'm the of only course. one who has access to this information. Elena, please contribute. And this was a beautiful inspiration and invitation uh, from Daniel's uh, part uh, for you uh, as the curator of 2022. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you so much. I am totally sorry. I'm totally agreeing with you all, um, and I would like to add just one thing. This uh, exhibition, I think, it brings together also um, a, a larger community. Uh, this connecting item that stands at the ground of this exhibition, this bug, which is something very simple. Um, if you think to come, if you come to think of it, um, is something that culturally connects, interconnects uh, the Roma community uh, with the Romanian community and other communities that uh, have it in, in their households. Uh, and I think it could be, it could, it has a lot of potential uh, to generate um, a lot of discussion and bonding. Uh, and thinking here about um, a solidarity born out of the fact that actually we do have common culture. Our cultures intertwine. Uh, and that is very important to me. And I would just like to add another thing. This is uh, this exhibition, uh, if it's going to, um, to be held 
it is not uh, just important for the Eugen Rapporteur, but also um, I'm emphasizing again on this for the young Roma artists coming uh, from uh, behind. Um, I work with them. Uh, I just um, I just designed their um, uh, their catalog, and everyone, each uh, and one of them, uh, they they look up to to the artists that you know held the flag high, because it is not and it was not uh, an easy task for them to be uh, uh, to to be Roma artists within uh, uh, the establishment. Thank you. That is all I wanted to say. Uh, and uh, I am sorry that I have to leave because I have to board the plane. It was uh, amazing to be with you and I'm very honored. And Eugen is very honored also and hope to meet you soon in person. Bye. Okay, that was really nice. And um, well, I, I to, to follow the, what the, the interventions by uh, Ethel and Daniel, well, for me, the, the very young idea of Roma art is a challenge, it's a question, it's an open question to, to the history of art itself and to the current reality of, of art. Um, um, Roma art made by Roma, although it seems like a, a, a repetition, it's also even more a, a challenge because if we go back to the history of modern art, we, we, we can see that we have been used as a model, we have been depicted, we have been represented. And, and some people push us to, to go back to that and to reclaim that. Like, oh, you, you, should, you should see that this is you and this is, uh, you should feel proud of how you have been depicted by Picasso. Or, well, I don't know. <laughs> I think it, the, the good thing about what Eriak is trying to show here in Venice is this open question that um, Roma art made by contemporary Roma artists is an open question to almost everything above all the institutionality that sometimes try to um, rule us, like if we were uh, out of um, the rule. No, we are not. Although sometimes we are, or because we have to be, but we know how to follow the procedure. So one of the lessons I think we have learned is that we have to, um, to be conscious of our position. We have to be also proud of our position of power. And um, we have to, to, to transfer that position of power, which is we are doing Roma art because we know we know our, our position. It has to be transformed in, into, into something that can have a equally dialogue with institutions. Because that's that's the problem that they, they don't recognize you as an equal. So solutions, okay, that's I think um, one of the possible solutions should be um, that that we Roma the the immense variety of Roma who are interested in art we should support even critically but we should we should support the presence of our Roma in international context like the one in Venice because we can then reverse the symbolic capital. So sometimes we we are we are told you you have all the capital um, the, the symbolic capital but you don't have the power. Well I think you we, we can reverse that and we can say no no we can have both yeah or we have to have both and yes and then the question of how the exhibitions and uh, helps to preserve the culture yes they do but uh, what i what i wish and, and i think you you might agree what i what I, I wish is that that we can show this art made by roma artists in all the roma communities and that's that that's why it's important to be in places like venice that it can help us to realize, wow, this is also us. This is another possibility of us. Um, yeah, obviously we, we, we wouldn't 
have done this without the support of uh, allied institutions? Yes, obviously. But that's also an op another question that should go to the institution that still don't help us or don't recognize us. That why are so little, so few institutions uh, acknowledging that Roma are, they are, and they don't need them to be. They just are, and they, they need to treat them equally. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, the only non-artist here, or non-sort non of uh, involved in the artistic scene, and I'm the only non-Roma as well. Uh, so from my point of view, um, and my only experience of, um, of uh, Eric's presence uh, at Biennale was uh, due to Roma, uh, the two years ago. Um, I was struck by the uh, great interest that the, um, the exhibition uh, attracted, um, the, um, the really important response uh, that Futi Roma had. And um, I don't know why that happened. Was it because it was particularly beautiful or intriguing or stimulating or perhaps a combination of all of, all of this? Um, but perhaps, uh, you know, more than anything else, I think it helped um, us all uh, to um, to think and look outside the box um, at, uh, at, um, at, the, at the Roma, at the Romani culture, but at also a non-Roma and, you know, at ourselves, at the non-Roma, you know, with all our prejudices and with, you know, with the burden of um, non-acceptance that you know goes back uh, centuries. So I think you know to me that was um, you know what what uh, you know what, what really is still with me from uh, you know from two two years ago. And when I talk about the um, the interest and the response, um, you know I'm thinking of the general public. You know going back to what uh, what you said, um, you know general public, but also institutions. Um, and uh, and the art world. Um, so I think that the, the reach was really wide, the response was wide, and the um, um, and you know from the little I know about uh, the um, uh, submission to next year's um, uh, Art Biennale, I mean I see you know quite a few similarities in in a way in the approach to uh, to what future Roma was. Um, and, and I think, you know, if I'm right, I think, you know, at the, um, at the next uh, presence is going to strike the right chords. Um, lessons learned apart from this, you know, the wide reach and the great interest and in the response, um, I'd say, um, you know, we should really be thinking of a, a permanent presence um, at Biennale. And, you know, if we can't talk about a pavilion, uh, you know, presence of some, some sort and, and try and widen it. Um, I think that, you know, this year's um, a theme of, um, of the um, Biennale architecture would have been a great one for the, for the Roma presence. And uh, so art, architecture, but also, uh, you know, the, what, what are considered in a way, well, the, I was going to say the minor, but, you know, the sort of the, the more recent, um, um, you know, biennales, theater, uh, music, dance, um, you know, all areas where um, Romani culture could make a, a great contribution. Uh, again, returning to lessons learned, I think um, perhaps the previous pavilions have not had the kind of community reach that we might have wanted in terms of communities on the ground being able to access them. And I know it's very difficult to get to Venice clearly, but maybe in the next incarnation, we can have a more 
um, extensive online presence to be able to share more. And I understand that there are going to be community based activities happening within the pavilion as well. So I really welcome that. I know we did have a couple at the uh, Future Roma, but I think if we can extend that more, that would be really good. Because I think it, it, it often seems that the Biennale is very remote from the situation on the ground, which it clearly is. And, you know, yes, the Biennale is an elitist institution. Yes, it's, it's very exclusive, but it's an important place for us to make progress in our main ambition, which is for equality. So if we can share that experience of the Biennale on a much wider footing through, I think it would probably have to be particularly in the light of COVID and the impact of that to continue, I think in the light, and I think through digital means or other means, maybe trying to get a catalog printed early on so that we can distribute that as well, maybe, or some kind of literature that can be more widely distributed. So I think accessibility to the wider, not just the wider Roman community, but wider communities generally would be a good, good thing to think about. Yeah, on that note, I think, I think what might actually be incredibly engaging would be to have during the summer of the Biennale a series. So, so to, to distribute the catalog, to have a digital presence, but also to have perhaps Biennale parties and multiple Biennales across Europe. I mean, I, you know, into the US, into Latin America would be great. But to really think about, you know, because one of the strengths, is, again, of, of ARIAC is the kind of network base, right? The ways in which it's grounded in communities. So we could have a collateral event of the collateral event in Sevilla, in London, um, you know, in Belgrade, in Shutka, you know, just kind of thinking about what it would mean to have these, the parties of parties. I think it would be just a, a beautiful thing. And, and it would really bring people that engagement. I mean, of course, and I think with, with Luisella's point about the permanent home in Venice, if we could stop worrying about trying to find a space in Venice, which I think is a lesson learned, like it's always, you know, every two years, and I'm gonna tell you that I have an idea for the architectural Biennale. So it may be that every year at some point we'll be doing this. Um, you know, that if that could be kind of taken away and then we could start to really, you know, I don't want to sort of use the let a thousand biennales bloom, which we have been doing. There's a Roma Biennale in Berlin, right? We, we've got Roma trial working on that. We've got various kinds of artistic places and practices that we could bring together throughout a kind of summer of, of celebration, which would be incredible. Um, I would like to add uh, that uh, your contributions to the acceleration uh, of the Roma cultural production and the Roma art scene as such. And when I say your contribution, I don't just mean personally the panelists, but the contributors of the artists, of the supporters, of the donors, of the institutions who endorse uh, uh, Roma artistic production uh, resulted in uh, an amazing outlook for 2022, which means that ERIAC and ERIAC's small Roma MoMA initiative has have grown into a real institutional presence in many of the art events around Europe in 2022, not just the Venice Biennale, but also Manifesta, Documenta, and our artists will be present in several contemporary art institutions around Europe. And uh, we have to take a moment, as you said, Etel, and celebrate this. And of course, we arrive to this other um, pause when we have to say, how do we construct a longer term and sustainable um, strategy for the preservation of this energy, for the preservation of the tangible items that we produce? Mm -hmm. Uh, the preservation of our cultural heritage and turning around the cultural heritage discourse as well, which never recognized our knowledges, our knowledge about the universe, our knowledge about our own history in Europe, our knowledge about the contribution to national culture. So uh, all this is undervalued and invisible, and it is time that we slowly smuggle this into the 
into the consciousness uh, of European art and European cultural production. Um, so this was to <laughs> incent you to think with me how to overcome these vicious circles of, uh, of this rejection because the Roma art project is very much of a political project. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. As Daniel said to quote him, it's self-referential often. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, and on the other hand, uh, we are we are also asking for spaces for ourselves, and these spaces are uh, claimed to be uh, isolated. You know, you know, the term cultural ghetto is how the vicious circle operates. So I'm also wondering if you see this tension as well that I identify in the area life and in the cultural life uh, of our community. Uh, and how to overcome, how to address this in an efficient manner going forward. Well, I, I, I don't think we should um, deny contradictions or tensions. I think we should encourage them because that's the way we, we, we have survived, like in tensions. So um, with both, I mean, we, we, we we encourage these contradictions everywhere. And that—that that is being present in the majority society as we have been since always, and having our own concept of time and space. So the good thing about Roma art is, is that itself is a, it's a conjunction of both. Yeah? So, well, how to... Well, that's my that, that the way I see. So I, I wouldn't deny the, the contradictions. I wouldn't deny the the critical uh, positions of different the the, the wide different um, diverse Roma uh, artist community. Um, but I will try to well that 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 would be a way of trying to spread all over uh, Europe and and make them support this dream no? of yay come on brothers, we should show our people what we are able to do. Obviously, our people and everybody, yes. But not, don't, don't be afraid to, to show our uh, strength to our people. Off the top of my head, in relation to the question, if I understood it correctly about how we can overcome resistance to inclusion in larger institutions like the Biennale in a more formalized manner. Um, I think that's, well, that's the question I'm answering. Um, how about um, trying to sign up major art museums from countries around Europe to fund the presence of Roma at the Biennale. I mean, not necessarily being within the Giardini or within, um, but at least to fund a collateral event, which um, it seems we are going to be again next year. So I think maybe trying to, rather than encouraging a single uh, donor or a number of single donor, political donors, maybe approaching art institutions, national, nationally funded art institutions, get a conglomerate of those together to, in a way, contribute to funds for a pavilion, a bit like, I mean, I don't understand the, the, quite the, the, the workings of the Polish system, but Zachenta kind of oversees the pavilion in Poland, and they kind of organize it and presumably fund it. So as our community has spread across the world, we could maybe approach someone like Zahenta and then several other key museums and ask them to join with us in a joint venture to fund the project. I mean, I don't think they'd have any influence in terms of embedding us within the Biennale, but in terms of having a, an ongoing revenue, which would be uh, have the interest of those institutions at heart because their expertise is the visual arts. Maybe that's something to think about. I'm just thinking, I think in kind of blue sky thinking, I think is the term. I, I want us to think a bit about what that might look like and think about kind of 
what it would mean to bring, and you know, so I'm thinking certainly the henta, but certainly then the tate and it's sugar money. I mean, you know, one of the things we we talk about, right? And and you know, um, Magda Matahe talks about reparations, but you know, we have to think about what it looks like to claim reparations, not as a solution, right? Never as a kind of, as Miguel says, right? We it it, it isn't about kind of separating ourselves from the world because we've always we've survived within the contradictions. That's right. That's exactly it, and. So thinking about kind of all the ways in which we've survived within the contradictions through, through slavery, through genocide, but you know, through kind of a denial of our language, our culture, all of those things, we've survived and we've flourished. And so if we live, if we kind of embrace that and claim not a separate space from the nation state, not being outside, right? We belong in Venice. We belong in Italy, we belong all over the world because that's how we've built our community, maintained our community. But we also, you know, the claiming of, of a kind of reparations, which will never make up for the larger history, but it could be one way of moving into a different kind of institutional support for the arts. I think it's very timely as well because given the amount of kind of scrambling to get black faces on walls in museums at the moment in the light of Black Lives Matters. They are kind of crying out for alternative representations of community. So I think it's a good time to be approaching institutions to in a way ex exhibit to them the benefit of, of having a Roma program within their institution. I mean, if we, if we signed up a number of these bodies, their contribution would be negligible in terms of individual um, museums. So I think having witnessed what's been happening in the rapid change in what's been happening in museums over the past year, it seems it's kind of unsightly because it's like they're scrambling to get something that looks different to what it looked like two years ago before the Black Lives Matter movement happened. So in a way, I imagine they would welcome such a, a, a proposal from us because it adds to their credentials now. It makes them seem to be moving away from the model which up until two years ago held sway. So I think, I mean, maybe this is for a private discussion. Maybe this shouldn't be on the internet, but I think it's um, something we can think about. Um, amazing ideas. Uh, it's so important for us to sit down and really reflect uh, on uh, the achievements and the challenges that we have. Uh, it's very important also to come together in space and online and have this space of reflection uh, because we fall, uh, uh, the modus operandi is we fall from one impossible challenge to the next. Uh, and, uh, and we really need to say thank you for this opportunity con to consider our stories yeah. and our experiences uh, uh, during uh, these challenges, because we have so much to learn. And as Etta said, to transfer across generations, transfer uh, as knowledge uh, forward on. Uh, I think we arrived uh, to uh, the part of this uh, discussion when we can open towards the audience and the participants. And I have very specific instructions from our technical team. We kindly ask you to either raise your hand virtually with the button uh, on your application in the bottom, which is a raised hand, or simply raise your hand literally on the screen uh, or here in the space uh, with us. And uh, feel free to uh, ask any questions uh, uh, to the panelists uh, and participants of this discussion.
Maybe there, there are questions in the chat. Andrea, are you indicate if there are questions? There isn't at the moment. Um, I uh, also prepared with a, a very nice uh, a question uh, for our panelists, which is um, if you think back in the histories of Biennale uh, participation, uh, which are those moments uh, that uh, that you felt that, uh, that really uh, embody uh, this highly charged political, em emotional, and cultural moment um, that we seek uh, with the Biennale participation. Not, not for sure a moment, but, uh, but something that you can, uh, uh, you can describe here, um, as perhaps we haven't spoke about yet, or just a, an artwork or a contribution, uh, the visit of the community, Very subjective uh, contribution I'm asking, I know, but uh, this is why it will be interesting to listen to. Okay, I have something from, I mean, just even 2007, when I was just, you know, a little Romney. I mean, <laughs> I wasn't so little, but I was a little Romney in 2007 in, sorry, um, in the US and not really knowing about what was happening in Europe at all. I mean, I knew a little bit about kind of, um, you know, activism and some of the work, but to see, for me to see Paradise Lost and then to see Call the Witness, to be kind of, because I mean, at that moment, but Paradise Lost, it engendered such hope and such, excitement in me I, I mean I just I thought wow we're, we're this is this is something we're finally kind of you know being recognized in a way and and that work and and the beauty of the community was there in paradise lost so I do want to say that but that was really a moment that changed I think at least for me a lot um, but I think across the time you know the excitement around so, and I'll stop soon because I, you know, sometimes I start to go on, but thinking about working with all of you and working with those of you who are in the audience right now, but maybe not, but the possibility of working together and creating new worlds and new senses of the world has meant everything. I mean, that's, and that is something, you know, when I, when I think about kind of my first, you know, really understanding that there was a Romani community outside of my family, right? Because I had an extended family and I thought that's who we are. I didn't know anything else, right? But, and that family was, you know, really held me in so many ways, right? And, and but then to <clears throat> think that we have a larger community and we can all do something together to make the world a more beautiful place. It just changed everything. I mean, I could talk about all the years and across the ways and particular pieces of art, but that larger feeling across time and across space is something that really, for me, it's held me. Thank you, Etta, for this, uh, you know, the bravery to share. Right? We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I would cite the opening of Future Roma. And at that opening, um, I was approached by Angelica Stepken, who is um, curator of Villa Romana in Florence, a fantastic contemporary art space. And what's interesting for that about me is because it showed that the exhibition and everything that had got onto the exhibition from Ariat, the artist and myself, was being appreciated by another contemporary art professional who wanted to take that show to her space. And that precipitated also the um, inauguration of a two artist residents at that space, two artist residences. So we invited two artists. We had a duo, we invited two artists to spend time in this residency at the uh, Villa Romana. And that's happening again this year. So what that signifies for me is that our presence in the Biennale can have impacts that are unexpected and lead to a greater flourishing of the Roma contemporary art scene and more opportunities for more Roma artists. 
but what I would say that somehow for me personally, every time I I feel moved by uh, an art work made by a Roma artist, and for me it's like a first of all it's a promise. It's a promise of what I would like to see. Like I want to see more. I want to see more, but at the same time, I want to see it many times. And I want to see it many times in special spaces. It's like when you go to a church or to, uh, you go to, to see, sometimes you go to, to that church to see one painting because you, you like that and you feel good. And, and then you just justify that and you make a divide around that, but it's, there is a this kind of connection that this uh, that sometimes some works can 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 provoke. So and that is for me that's one of the most crucial experiences in Roma art, which is a, the the Roma individual capacity to connect to other Roma individuals. And then from that experience, that there is something new and old at the same time happening. To me, what's exciting about uh, the Roma presence at Biennale is the implicit recognition of uh, uh, Roma nationhood. I mean, we don't want to call it a pavilion, um, you know, <laughs> um, but it, it's a collateral event, but it's a Roma, a Romani presence and it's, uh, it's a very large, um, well, the largest uh, minority in uh, in Europe, uh, the um, the most discriminated today minority in Europe, and it's a nation state, uh, and um, and it's here in Venice, and that's exciting. Thank you for uh, sharing these very subjective uh, responses uh, uh, also with the audience. Uh, and uh, we have additional questions. Uh, one is, um, is, will there be any connection established between the Roma and the Polish exhibitions at the Biennale? Uh, as the audience knows that Polish exhibition will contribute a Roma artist, Magor Zratamir Gatash, as I, uh, as I said before. So this question, uh, I don't think we can respond to yet. But I think we can say that we've, you know, Mirga, uh, um, sorry, Gosha, Malgorzata Mirgatas is ours just as much as she's Poland's, right? I mean, we, we've loved her and her work and supported her work and, we want to continue to do that in whatever form we can, right? I mean, I think that's part of it is that this is a this is a celebration for us, and we're hoping that we can continue those those connections. I think there are bound to be connections, even if they're not formalized. Well, the connections already exist. We have worked with Malgorzata Mirgatas several times before. Ariak wishes uh, to contribute uh, resources and energies to the Polish pavilion. Uh, there is no formal agreement. I mean, the Polish pavilion has been announced a few days ago, and we need to hear from the curators first before we make a public announcement on the formalities. Uh, but uh, our passions, our hearts are also uh, in that uh, location and also that location would give the Roma cause very important political recognition as well. And the community, of course, the community that uh, that considers the Roma exhibition a pilgrimage place during the Biennale shall see both locations. We have uh, audience interest. Uh, and as I see, uh, MSH Molnar would like to address us. Is that possible technically? So, Emesha, please take the floor. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for waiting. Uh, 
Um, it was a privilege to listen to this discussion and thank you for your thoughts. Um, it's such a pity I cannot be in Venice. Uh, but uh, I thought that uh, already we, you have touched upon this subject, but maybe to the audience who is not that familiar uh, with the whole uh, Biennale logic itself, uh, you have this privileged uh, point of view or overview of, uh, of Roma representation and Roma presence in Venice since 2007. So if you could reflect a bit if there has any change uh, been made or any progress on behalf of the Biennale organizers itself. So was there any change in their stance um, since only nation states or national representations can participate as uh, well in the in the main pavilions in the Giardini and Arsenale, how do you see this process? If you could reflect upon that a bit, and thank you. Okay. Thanks, because that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest question, and that's why, well, in, my, in my opinion, that's why I say earlier that Roma art made by Roma itself is a challenge. It's a challenge to sometimes a nation state um, narrative. So, well, we we hope we hope that those responsible hear this and hear this debate, hear this demand, this international demand. They are, I, I hope they are clever enough to, to well, if the rules uh, that are applied in such a way that um, apply this kind of equal, equality from the law, uh, like, like you are, we are treated as equal as anyone else, well, okay, <laughs> then we have to change the uh, rules, not to be treated un unequally, but to treat to be treated fairly, <laughs> and that's that's the question. So, well, I well, yeah, I I I, I would only add that the, what we need is more Roma to support this move, and that because if we are a growing number of artists, our projects, and allied institutions supporting the, mm, the life of Roma art, then they should know that. So we have to come on, join us. <laughs> yeah, and I, I also want, I mean, I think it's really important because we, it, yes, that is the question. And, and I think Miguel's point about being treated fairly is very different from being treated equally. And there was a point, I think, you know, when we think about the post-war order of nation states, when it was the kind of large nation states who have their space in the center of the Biennale as the national representatives. And what we see is that we're, you know, we're part of the collateral events. Um, and a lot of the post-colonial nations, when we think about kind of the, the so-called third world, right? When we, I, I just went to the Grenada uh, Pavilion, which is outside of the Giardini. Right, but we look across um, at the various places and, and we're still part of not just a Romani struggle, but a larger global struggle of racialized minorities, right? Of post-colonial nations who are not at the center of the Biennale, even though our artistic production is really to be blunt is what keeps the Biennale afloat. So part of what we're struggling for and what we're pushing to be recognized is that it's our work along with the work of various diasporas, right? We think about kind of um, the African diaspora, we think about refugee groups, we think about kind of you know, various people who have, who have really made the, the, the old order, right? Uh, in some ways both irrelevant, but but enriched it, right? When we think about kind of post-colonial cities and, 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 and post-colonial nation states, right? How do we then shift power so that we are recognized for the cultural production? And I could again be blunt and say the extraction of that cultural production um, and to think about how to reverse that and really shift it and make it a space where we have the kind of recognition that we deserve both in the Biennale but then 
within the larger kind of, you know, various spheres. Um, I will uh, continue with an other extremely challenging uh, uh, invitation and question from the audience, which is how do we imagine the mentioned permanent presence at both the art and architecture Biennale to influence other cultures outside of common territorial narratives of cultural representation? So we did mention permanent presence uh, uh, amongst our ideas and potential solutions, and the, the audience is asking us to imagine this in uh, more detail. Um, and I think uh, the space uh, potentially. Um, Every time we come to Venice, uh, to the Biennale, the space is the major question, apart from the collateral event fee and, uh, and permanent, a permanent location perhaps would solve uh, uh, or make it easier for us to be present uh, in Venice. There are no specific plans, uh, but uh, perhaps it is better to put our energy into finding a permanent location. This is also a question to Luisella Pavanwolf, who knows the cultural scene of Venice better than us who travel in every second year for the Biennale participation. Well, in Venice, you have a lot of um, um, empty spaces. Uh, it, you know, um, it, they would need um, restoring and the upkeeping wouldn't be cheap. Uh, but basically the idea would be to have a sort of um, a, an area cantena in, uh, in Venice, um, you know, a space where you could keep um, a small secretariat, um, where you could organize artistic presence, um, events uh, throughout the year, and also, um, you know, a space which would be um, large enough to uh, host uh, the um, uh, art or architect or both architectural biennale. I mean, that that would be, I think, in my in my view, and uh, waiting for. Um, a pavilion in the Giardini or, you know, together with all the, the, the countries that don't have a pavilion in the Giardini. I mean, that, that would be um, a, a solution which would uh, ensure that you don't have to hunt around for a, uh, for a location uh, every year or every couple of years. I, I look at our technical uh, support and ask if there's any more audience questions at the moment. And I also take a look at the audience on screen. And if there is no more hand, yes, Rosa, please. Hello, yes. Um, I've been quite um, excited by all of the things you know, listening to everyone remember um, and reflect and critically reflect as well on the previous um, events or artworks and experiences from that personal but also that professional lens. And I think there's something quite important there that, you know, keeps kind of coming up this idea of that Roma, the Roma community were diverse that there's something that we can transcend these these borders and boundaries through art and through, you know, this kind of collective representation, but also not forgetting the individual. Um, and, you know, that I think, you know, also this idea of having di using different platforms, whether that's kind of that body to body or the digital or different countries and how, you know, so it, it it's also bringing me back to some of the questions we're asking ourselves within Weave around, you know, what is the space like Europeana, this digital library? Um, how can that support some of these this, these processes of critically reflecting personally and artistically reflecting? And that opens up questions around um, ethical questions. It opens up questions around our values, our personal ones, those as a community. 
um, those as artists, you know, uh, the, the values or ethical questions for a dancer might be very different from a visual artist. And so how do we continue to kind of challenge ourselves to keep thinking? And the more presence we have in these number of spaces, it feels like it supports that, it primes us to think about that in a number of ways. And, um, you know, and also another point that I've heard is is around the political. There's a real kind of political point that in presence that we have through this artistic work and our that practice and so that feels also really important to to just kind of honor as well um and you know prima Ethel, you said um the everyday you know the the women and thinking about not the intellectual kind of uh, work in terms of academia, but also that kind of grassroots, the community. And I think that that's, you know, just so powerful to kind of keep highlighting that there's such a diversity among the community and so many perspectives. And it's not about agreeing, but it's about just continuing to bring the young people as well as our elders into this kind of focus and coming back together. And it just seems like, you know, we're you know, whether it's Ven Venice Biennale, Europeana, or other kind of satellite, pro small projects, major projects, you know, but just kind of asking ourselves to reflect feels so um, important. And, you know, Daniel, you also mentioned that with asking institutions to, to reflect, and now is a, a moment maybe to approach some of those spaces. Um, you know, and Miguel Angel, you were also describing, you know, flamenco and how that's a really kind of very specific art form that's very layered and how you know we think about the past but also just move forward and and how how do we we um let flamenco be its space and is there something of of you know uh, Roma art and so yeah I just you know I found this whole day really inspiring and I know our artist um, Eugene has been very um, quiet but I don't know if you wanted to say something as well about you know you're kind of part of now this this space and it just feels um, so thank you to everyone for it's been really exciting and, and really um, inspiring so thank you thank you Rosa, you started the final remarks in a beautiful way. So I will continue exactly this exercise uh, that you introduced, which is uh, um, I'm asking you to pick a few notions, ideas from your notes or from your mental notes that you you have taken from the meeting uh, and, uh, and just uh, share it with us. Two or three is sufficient. We have to have a, a closing remarks. Uh, uh, round uh, um, and uh, so that you can take some time to think. I will start, and Eugen, please also uh, let us know about your thoughts uh, in this uh, closing circle uh, of coming together. Uh, so uh, I uh, I wrote down it's a central uh, position on my notes: the permanent presence, and I was inspired by. Uh, Ilina Shilaru's comment on intertwined cultures and bonding, an opportunity for bonding. And I loved uh, uh, Daniel's recommendation, which also rings with uh, Etel's uh, uh, idea of multiple celebrations, parties um, within the communities. But Daniel mentioned the next incarnation could actively invite the community and engage the community. And I really liked uh, uh, so many notes I have taken of the beautiful uh, texts, ideas, and sharing that uh, you have done today. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. I pass the word to whoever already can uh, continue the line. Well, I'm um, kind of aware of the fact that we've come a very long way since 2007. Mm -hmm. Um, and your original idea, Timea, of uh, a Roma pavilion in Venice. And this year we have, we're gonna have presence in two pavilions, which is fantastic. So I think um, even though maybe progress is slow in terms of changing the beast that is the Biennale, I think we can take 
some victories with us today and some ideas about how to enhance our position and how to move forward to a, a place of more security here. Um, yes, it's, 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 been, it's, been, it's been good today to kind of see the trajectory of um, the development of the idea of contemporary Roma art from its beginnings until now and the very bright future that it has. So that, that's been very, very rewarding for me. Yes, for me, it's to, to say it's, it's been a pleasure to discuss and think and dream together. And, and I hope and some of the idea that we have shared can, can get into a position so we can just feel the proud that we we feel every day, but we can uh, use it for being stronger in the political context. Yeah. I do you want to go? Um, I was inspired by a number of things. Um, yes, I want to continue to dream together. And I was thinking a lot about, you know, I, Daniel, your point about including the community and also laying claim to national galleries. And that, that's incredible. And I think it's very important. Um, and it's something I would like us to build upon. And then Luisella, I loved the fact that you kind of just put it out there, we're a nation state. And right, and I, and I think, and, and right, and that's, that's so key. And that's such a deep kind of moment of recognition and solidarity that I really appreciate. And just, I love that. And to me, I, I, was, I was both inspired and really, I'm going to think a lot about the ways in which you framed it as turning around the cultural heritage model, that we have to preserve cultural heritage and we have to kind of, to use Marx, right? Flip it on its head, do, you know, do something where we find something new in that. Um, and Miguel, what I, what I really loved um, when you said the contradictions and that we live in these contradictions, that it's really our survival depends upon living in the contradiction. Um, and what I appreciated also, what, what I think, um, you know, I think is kind of amazing, both the ways in which the participation um, of our colleagues online who have really come in and said, you know, we're here and we are part of this larger diaspora. So, you know, Rosa's idea of weaving and against sort of the, the ways in which you're claiming these intimate spaces of the everyday, they're really what we build upon and where we can see our future and, and our, again, coming back, our dreams and, and our hopes. There were really quite a lot of uh, very interesting ideas um, that were put on the table. And uh, I think that we should use uh, the next collateral event to, uh, as a sounding board and, and to test some of them. Um, Daniel's idea of approaching um, museums, uh, foundations, uh, um, art spaces, um, both abroad and in Venice, there are you know, quite a lot of presences here. Um, um, your idea, Daniels, of uh, um, increasing the um, online presence, I think that's been a lesson learned uh, from uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, we can uh, widen our audience and, and participation to anything we do uh, by, by using um, the um, technologies. Um, and um, um, the, um, what else, the, the idea of, um, you know, parting and uh, widening the community reach. Um, last time in Future Roma, we had uh, a very beautiful event at the, at the end. Um, we should try and, and, and um, increase that. And, um, and also, I think, um, you know, next year there will be the uh, presence of the, of the um, Roma artists in the Poli Polish pavilion and the collateral event, hopefully. And, uh, and we should use that uh, as an opportunity to approach other national um, 
pavilions and, and try to sell this idea of uh, uh, aroma presence and space in, in some of the uh, national pavilions. And, and these are just some of the, uh, you know, I think the very good thoughts that were put on the table, but let's use uh, the next collateral event really to test all this. Amazing, and Elgin, a few thoughts you take away? Can you share with us? Eu pot să fiu mândru că voi face parte din această nouă era a etniei noastre culturale. I'm uh, happy and proud to be part of this new era of uh, Roma culture and uh, this uh, new Roma nation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're also extremely proud and happy to work with you. And we're looking forward with such excitement, as you heard, uh, to bring in the community and celebrate in multiple locations, as Etel suggested, together with you and your team. Um, and uh, we are uh, arriving to the end of this discussion. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, uh, my uh, privilege to thank the contributors to the beautiful team of ERIAC, the Council of Europe office, MIROS, the technical team, and, uh, and the engaged and active uh, participants and audience as well. Uh, most importantly, our hosts, Rosa, uh, from the VIV uh, uh, and the virtual part uh, of the discussion, uh, and also Luisella Pavan Wolf uh, from the Council of Europe, Venice representation, who made it possible for us to be here in present, in real life uh, circumstances, uh, uh, and reflect together on these important questions. Thank you for being with us today. And we see you at the next uh, ERIAC event. Bye.